Welcome to The Road. This is a weekly podcast of All Saints Lutheran Church. I'm your host, John Pedersen, and I serve as pastor. Each week, we reflect on faith, life, and navigating the road ahead. The language of journey is common when we think about life. It has its joys and challenges along the way, and we all need a little encouragement and guidance at times to keep us going. There's a word in the Bible, asphalia, which means truth, but it's the same root word we use in English for asphalt, if you can believe that is a solid surface that makes travel easier and more assured. And so every week we're going to be exploring elements of faith and life that keep us on the road. Faith isn't about living a perfect life. It's about finding our way, getting through rough spots, but seeking out those great vistas too. You can find my weekly message here, but you'll also find special conversations with guests who have insights on things like wellness, parenting, and living with unique purpose. If you appreciate this podcast, remember to subscribe where possible and share it with a friend. Here's this week's message. Well, I had my uh, last official pottery class on Friday, sort of a little vestige of sabbatical time. I finished prepping and glazing my pieces for their final firing, but there is one more piece left that I uh, finished trimming on Friday, which was a large bowl. It was like my crowning achievement, maybe. We'll see. Um, It's the heaviest piece and the largest piece I made, and because of that, I'm a little more concerned about whether it might crack when it gets fired for the first time. I'll know more next week when I go back to glaze it. But putting any piece of pottery into the kiln is a test. Different thicknesses in the base and walls can contribute to cracks, along with uneven drying and other stress points. As we all know, life itself is filled with stress points. We can feel it when we're pushed to the edge as we handle uh, big competing demands on our time and our mental and emotional capacity. We feel it when we're experiencing grief, when we're tired, or life is just out of balance. It's at times like these that we're most vulnerable to showing cracks and breaking down in some way under testing like a large pottery piece. As Jesus started his ministry, he was tested under intense pressure. He was led into the desert wilderness by himself and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights according to the story. He was famished. And if Jesus is ever going to let go of his mission and his values, this would be it. And so this classic passage of the temptation or testing of Jesus not only serves to show us how he stayed true to his values and purpose in the end, but we get to see where some of those key stress points were for him. And if they were stress points for him, no doubt they are for us as well. The devil used the 40 days Jesus spent in the wilderness as an opportunity to break him. Each temptation had its own method and scheme, but they are all a test geared toward making Jesus care more about himself and his own needs than the people he was sent to serve. One way of seeing this whole period is that if the devil can get Jesus preoccupied with himself, then he wins. The first temptation goes to basic human needs and instincts, hunger. I mean, Jesus had eaten nothing in his time in the wilderness. We know he would later change water into wine and feed 5,000 later in his ministry, so certainly turning a stone into a simple loaf of bread would have been doable for the Son of God. Of all three temptations, though, this one seems maybe the most arbitrary. Eating for survival, I mean, that shouldn't be something that's really good or bad, but it really gets down to the deeper importance Can Jesus rise above hardship and remain faithful to his mission? In this case, the point of this time was to remain true to his fast. This is an experience of testing and spiritual strengthening. And so will Jesus begin to rely on his own miraculous power to serve himself? Or will he save that to serve others? If he opens that door, then what? Whenever Jesus performs a miracle in his ministry, whether it's healings, feeding 5,000, stilling a storm, or walking on water, it's either to help someone or to help teach his disciples something. 
Jesus resists the urge to make food for himself. One does not live by bread alone, he says, but by the words that come from the Lord. So there are different ways to think about the second temptation, but today I'd like to suggest it's just about doubt. As the devil takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple, what's important about this test is that the devil begins with the word if. He does it in the first temptation as well. If you are the son of God, then do this. And the second time he says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you. He's sowing seeds of doubt. Am I really the son of God? I'd like to be able to prove it to myself and this guy. If I jumped, I would know. But Jesus doesn't go down that road. Scripture also says, do not put the Lord your God to the test, he says. Jesus knows he's loved already. He knows he's son of God. Jesus opts for faith. He chooses to believe in the words spoken from the heavens at his baptism. You are my son, the beloved with you. I am well pleased. He doesn't need to do anything more for that. Sometimes you may wonder, others may question you, are you really good enough? Have you done enough? Does God really love you? Are you really forgiven? Martin Luther, during periods of spiritual struggle and doubt, often returned to his baptism as a source of reassurance and affirmation as a child of God. Doubt is natural. Every Christian has doubts. The presence of doubt isn't unusual. The question is whether we allow our doubts to control us or whether we allow the faith, hope, and love of Christ to shape us. Doubt and fear turns us in on ourselves. Love and grace allow us to open up and turn to others and to God. Again, the big if the devil hurls at Jesus would drive a wedge between Jesus and God. But instead, Jesus continues on in the relationship of faith and trust that he already has. As you struggle with your own worth and wonder if God truly loves you, Jesus shows us how we can embrace God's promises for us again. So the final temptation is all about power. The devil takes Jesus to a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and says to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. No hidden agendas here. The devil lays it all out there with clarity. Worship me and no one else gets hurt. What you want is good, Jesus. I believe in you and what you want. If you were in control of this world, my goodness, things would finally be set right, wouldn't they? Wouldn't it be good to have the leverage and power to see it all through, Jesus? This whole picture of the devil or Satan that is portrayed in this story of the temptation of Jesus is probably the closest comparison to the portrayal of him that we have in the book of Job. In Job, Satan or Satan appears to have a kind of uneasy relationship with God and is constantly harping on the weak-willed nature of God's people. Satan in Hebrew literally translates as the accuser. He's like the prosecuting attorney that breaks down every conceivable sin and weakness that he sees in an attempt to drive a wedge between God and the one who stands accused, to drive the person to hopelessness and to get God to punish the transgression and betrayal. The devil at least pretends to support a better world. He's just a, a more aggressive and willful actor that wants to make everything right by force and accusation. In the devil's eyes, God is weak and far too compassionate. So what the devil is offering Jesus is the opportunity to seize power and to acknowledge that the devil's more simple and straightforward approach has merit. Jesus, of course, doesn't go down that road. Christian faith teaches something revolutionary about power. Every one of us has some degree of power and power in any form, whether it's money, status, education, position, or choice is not for simply amassing for ourselves and our own needs and agenda. Power is for using on behalf of others. 
And so in this final temptation, the stage is set for the way Jesus' life and mission will end. Jesus is not on a path of domination, and it means that if he will not dominate, he himself will get crushed. St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 1, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And he goes on to say, we proclaim Christ crucified, which is seen as both a stumbling block and foolishness, but God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The message of the cross is about Christ's sacrifice for us. As Paul writes in Philippians 2, Jesus did not count equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. In his eventual crucifixion, it may seem that Jesus loses, but instead Jesus will relinquish his power for the sake of others. As Peter says, In Acts 2, God raised him up, having freed him from death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Hard power and the quick and easy fix always show promise, but Jesus offers a different form that has eternal value. This is the heart of Jesus' life, teachings, death, and resurrection. There are some in every age who use the name Christian and who do nothing short of take the devil up on his deal in order to enforce what they see as Christian values and ideals, and yet in doing so, they lose the very spirit and heart of who Jesus is. Again, the common thread in all of these temptations is about testing Jesus to see if he'll abandon his relationship with God and go his own way, placing his own needs and wants and desires above the needs of the people that he's been called to serve and his mission. Although these tests in the wilderness may seem a little extreme or arbitrary, the truth is everyone faces temptation. And temptation often does present a good case. The voice of temptation says, you know, a little bit wouldn't hurt anyone. I would have had it coming to me anyway. I deserve it. They deserve it. I can't do much about it. Fight fire with fire. The ends justify the means. One of the best books written on temptation, if you're interested, is The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. It's entertaining, and it's written from the perspective of a senior demon named Screwtape to his nephew Wormwood as they conspire to undermine the spiritual life of a young man. Among the people who have read The Screwtape Letters is M. Scott Peck, a best-selling author and psychiatrist who came to faith later in life. Peck, who himself had Uh, been an atheist, when he read it, writes this about encountering one passage of the book. Peck writes, at one point, Screwtape advises Wormwood to make sure that the man, now a young Christian, due to their combined bungling, regard his time as his time. This sentence at first made no sense to me, Peck wrote. I read it three times. I wondered if there might be some typographical error. How else could anybody think of his time except as his own? And then it dawned on me that the possibility existed of my time belonging to a power higher than myself. For a good while, it was a most discomforting notion, and still today I'm continuing to learn to submit my time to God's ownership. It wasn't until a dozen years later, however, that I actually submitted to being baptized as a Christian. Peck gained a new insight that time is also a form of power. We can use it entirely for ourselves or invest it in others on behalf of God. Throughout all of his his temptations in the wilderness, Jesus never let go of his relationship with God. He doesn't give in to the ifs and never stops trusting that God desires good for him. God's love and care is unconditional. Jesus believes God is with him without the need to perform miracles or make spectacular displays of faith, or even justify his life by accomplishing a grand vision of change throughout all the kingdoms of the world by sheer will and force. The Spirit is with Jesus in the wilderness. He was not alone. Know that the Spirit is with you. You are not alone. We are not Jesus. We do fall short in our own tests, our clay, may crack at times, 
But Jesus knew this. Jesus loved us to the end, even despite our failings. He went to his death speaking not words of attack, but words of mercy and grace for us and for everyone, even those who mocked him and betrayed him. And in his resurrection, we have affirmation that his way, not the devil's way, represents the true power of God and the only way forward. In all of your own wilderness journeys, trust in God's love for you, that even as one who fails your own test, you can live in God's love and let that love empty into the world through you. Amen. That's this week's message. You don't have to navigate the road ahead alone. You can join with others at All Saints. Visit allsaintsmtka.org for more information. Have a great week.